Now, today I'd like to discuss some of our research with electrochemical sensors, in particular, a uh, new instrument we've developed. It's a six in channel <coughs> potential study. Now, you might already be familiar with my research with detecting DNA sequences using a typical potential stat with an electrochemical probe. Now, the 16 channel potential stat is much more powerful because you can do 16 individual experiments basically at once. 16 individual sensors operated simultaneously. And you can imagine the significance in data analysis, statistical analysis, you can reproduce the same experiment without having to do it after experiment number one. It's all contained on one device. Now, if you're not familiar with my research, I'm going to give an overview of where we started and where we are now in the detection of prostate cancer biomarkers. So why would we want to detect biomarkers of cancer, in this case, prostate cancer? Well, PSA, you've probably heard of PSA, prostate-specific antigen. This is typically what's used to detect prostate cancer. However, recently, research is showing more and more it's giving false positives. So it's not very specific to prostate cancer patient might not even have the cancer, but because his PSA levels are high, the doctors diagnose him with prostate cancer, and then you know, he's got to go through a whole lot of different therapy. So if you can develop a biomarker that's more specific, this would be tremendously helpful in the medical field. And what's been shown is that hypermethylated DNA, this is a great biomarker for prostate cancer. And it's actually been shown in the body fluids of cancer patients. Now, this particular gene, which we're interested in, is called the glutathione S transferase pi 1 gene. And this shows methylation. When I say methylation, it means this five prime position on cytosine is methylated. We have a CH3 group or a methyl group on that DNA base, cytosine. We have four types of bases. Okay. You're familiar from that, from biochemistry, biology. What are the four bases that define a <coughs> DNA sequence? Right, adenine, that's one. What else? Guanine, what else? Our cytosine and last one, thymine. Okay. So these four bases, depending on how you arrange them, you have various genes. Our gene, GSTP1 gene in the promoter region, is really methylated. You can see the percent methylation all over almost 90%, right? Some 100% methylation in prostate cancer patients. Whereas a regular healthy individual with no signs of prostate cancer, you don't even see these cytosines methylated. <coughs> so we call this hypermethylation, overmethylation. So if I can pick up this short sequence, I don't necessarily have to detect the entire gene. All I'm interested in is maybe 27 bases of the gene, because this gene is incredibly large, hundreds of bases. If I can just detect this sequence, which would be methylated, that would tell me this individual is predisposed to prostate cancer. So how do we detect that sequence? Well, what we devised was an electrochemical probe consisting of a platinum disc electrode First, we work with relatively large disc electrodes. I'm talking about the scale of millimeters, about two millimeters in diameter. And you, can, you could see that platinum disc with the naked eye. Then we moved on to 25 micron diameter, 25 microns. Your hair is about maybe 50 microns thick, 50 micrometers thick. Okay. So this is about half 
thickness of your hair, really thin hair. So now to see that, you really need a microscope. And that's the platinum disc with the layer, with the sensing layer deposited on it. If we didn't have that layer deposited, it'd be a nice shiny platinum metallic uh, disc. So we deposit the sensing layer. It consists of a bilayer of conducting polymers. So conducting polymer, it's, it's a polymer, kind of like plastic, which conducts electricity. And we need it to conduct electricity so we can use it as an electrochemical sensor. If it didn't conduct electricity, it would just be an insulator. We wouldn't be able to read any information, any potential difference. So here's our platinum disc electrode on the macro scale, right, at least two millimeters in diameter. We deposit this bilayer polypyro and also this other uh, conducting polymer TPT. We'll discuss that in a moment. Let me close this. And then we finally graft magnesium ions onto that polymer, and it completes our layer. This is the second polymer, the TPT, and the reason we use this is because of this phosphonic acid group, which binds to magnesium. And then finally the DNA probe is attached. So let's imagine we have a sequence of DNA, we'll call that the probe DNA. This is already attached to the sensor, this side. And then we have target DNA on this side. This is in solution, this is our sample. For example, uh, a patient sample. And if that probe DNA If that probe DNA is complementary to the target, we say it hybridizes. It matches perfectly. For example, adenine matches with thymine. Guanine matches with cytosine. Right? This sequence of DNA would be complementary to this sequence of DNA, and hence they hybridize. And you see from this diagram, you have three hydrogen bonds here between guanine and cytosine and only two hydrogen bonds here between adenine and thymine. You know the guanine cytosine bond is stronger when they hybridize. So this is key for us to be able to make this technique selective. Selective to only a certain sequence of DNA which we define. I can determine what target this hybridizes to based on the sequence of the probe. If I change the sequence of the probe, for example, it's TAA, then what would hybridize with TAA? ATT, right? AT&T. Okay. Here this is just two bases for my probe and also two bases for the target. But our sequences are larger. We typically use 15 bases for the probe and 27 bases for the target. We'll look at that sequence, and that sequence is directly from that gene, the GSTP1 gene. We're looking at that gene once again. So again, you determine what target you detect based on the probe you select. Just like with any particular type of lock, only a certain key can open it. You make it selective to that key. So this diagram illustrates all of it put together on the molecular level. What's going on? Well, here's my electrode, right? This is just platinum disc electrode. In our case, we're working with the 25 micron, and I actually have a platinum disc electrode here. This is a microelectrode. We made these ourselves. Now you can obviously purchase these commercially as well if you like, but they cost about a little over 100 bucks, so they're pretty expensive. We needed close to 50 of these for work over you know, a couple years. But you can pass this around, and if you look at the tip, if, if you've got really strong eyes, you might be able to even make out 
that tiny platinum disc, which is 25 microns in diameter. That's 25 divided by a million. 25 meters, right, divided by a million gives you 25 micrometers. So this is one microelectrode. And this is acting as our electrochemical probe after we polymerize the pyro and then the TPT. These are conducting polymers. So when we apply a potential, we can actually get a nice film to deposit on that tiny platinum. Now that platinum, it's encased in glass. Okay, that's glass surrounding it. And then we attach the probe DNA. We do this by having magnesium act as a bridge between this group, phosphonic acid group, and the phosphate group of the DNA. So, you know, DNA is composed of this phosphate backbone. And magnesium, since it's divalent, it can accommodate both these charges, since it's 2 plus. And finally, if we have target in solution, this is what we're trying to detect. If the target DNA is in solution, it's going to hybridize, bind to the probe DNA, and now what's going to occur is this chloride, now what you might ask, where did this chloride come? Well, we run CV, a cyclical tomogram, in a solution of tris HCl buffer containing chloride ions. This chloride won't be able to pass through this barrier as easily when we run the cyclical tomogram. So a CV, it's nothing more than changing the potential and measuring the current. So we change the potential using a potentiostat. That's the instrument, the 16 channel potentiostat. That's one type of potentiostat. Potentiostat we develop. By changing the potential and measuring the CV, we can determine how much of that chloride ion is being exchanged. If the level of chloride exchange drops off, that means it's hybridized. So we'll see how that all works together in this slide. So once again, I have my disk electrode. I've polymerized the bilayer, the conducting bilayer. I've grafted the magnesium, and we graft the magnesium by just placing in magnesium chloride for about 15 minutes, attaches magnesium to the phosphonic acid group here on TPT. And we run a CV. This is just a simple background CV. <coughs> Again, current versus potential. And then we attach the probe DNA. We leave it in a solution of probe DNA for approximately 30 minutes, and it attaches to the magnesium. So we've immobilized this DNA by attaching it to the bridge, magnesium bridge. Once again, we run the CV. Not, not a huge change from here, from the background. So this is after attachment of the probe DNA. So this CV is really important because if we have this target DNA in solution, if the patient carries that particular DNA sequence, for example, and it hybridizes to the probe, well, when I run the CV now, it decreases, it shrinks. The current is decreased. Now, why does the current decrease going from here to here? What's the main reason? Who can speculate? Because of hybridization, what happens? Remember the chloride ion? The chloride ion can't move about as easily. It's hindered. The exchange through this layer is hindered because now we have this double charge. We go from a charge of Q to 2Q because the phosphate backbone increases when you have DNA hybridized. You have double-stranded DNA now. This was single-stranded DNA. And if it hybridizes, you have double-stranded DNA. And so that double negative charge is going to hinder chloride exchange. That's also negatively charged. And that's represented by this decrease in the cyclic photomogram, the CV. The current decreases. And this would be a positive test, right, for that particular DNA sequence, having this decrease. So that's just for any DNA sequence. We've, we've already shown you can detect 
any DNA sequence using that technique with macro and micro electrodes. Now we wanted to show that you could actually detect whether or not it was methylated. Now remember methylation, it's on the epigenetic level. That means the DNA sequence is literally the same. The only difference is it has that methyl group, that methyl group at the five prime position of cytosine. So what we did was we used the bisulfite kit to convert all the cytosines that were methylated, you can be, those are represented by the lowercase m above and below the C. So when you use bisulfite, when you use a bisulfite kit, what happens is, let's look at one here, for example, you guys, you see the C's here, the C, the cytosine residues, they're all converted to uracil. Uracil won't hybridize with guanine, whereas cytosine will hybridize. It's complementary to guanine. But if it's methylated, for example, this cytosine here is methylated, and I use the bisulfite kit, bisulfite conversion kit, on that particular sequence, the cytosine remains, remains the cytosine because it was methylated. However, the other cytosines which weren't methylated, they're still converted to uracil and they won't bind, they won't be complementary to guanine. So we make it selective to DNA that's methylated. If it's not methylated, it's converted to uracil, and we know uracil won't bind to guanine on our probe DNA. So this what experiment... Is, what is the source of uracil again? Source of what? Uracil. Well, the uracil is just a variation of, of the cytosine going no, through the bisulfite. The, the DNA the, itself. The RNA? No, no, no. The DNA itself, so through a process, it's about uh, three, three different treatments when you do the bisulfite kit. So going back to this slide, It takes, it's they, they said it takes like 30 minutes, but it actually takes closer to 45 minutes to perform. Maybe with some practice you can even get it down to about 35 I'm minutes. Because DNA is not supposed to have your cell. Not to come from some RNA messenger or something. DNA does not have your cell. Yeah, You're right. So where would but remember, this, this is a chemical conversion. You have, you're treating your DNA with various chemicals and through the, it's actually organic synthesis, you're converting your cytosine to a variation of a different base, in this case the uracil. Okay. But you're right, uracil is not in DNA, and that's, that's why it works here, because now that uracil will not bind to guanine, it's not complementary. So we've made the unmethylated DNA non-complementary through this treatment. If we don't do this treatment, regardless of whether it's methylated or unmethylated, so for example, here are the target sequences, unmethylated and methylated, you would expect this to be in a prostate cancer patient and the unmethylated in a healthy individual. They would both bind to our probe, and they would both show a decrease in the CV, as we saw here, if we don't perform the bisulfite conversion we don't use that kit, that extra step. So that's really key here to use that bisulfite kit to do the conversion. So what does this illustrate? Well here we have unmethylated DNA in the red curve and methylated DNA, red curve on the right hand side, after the probes were placed in the target solution. And you see with unmethylated DNA, it wasn't complementary, it didn't hybridize, so we didn't see a decrease in the CV. The blue curve is the probe DNA, right? That's what we're comparing the red curve to. Whereas here, there's definitely a decrease going from blue to red. So this is just the probe DNA after attachment of probe DNA, we ran the CV, and after attachment of target, which was methylated and undergone 
the bisulfite conversion, we get this curve. Now, just eyeballing it, it's obvious. You have a significant decrease in the CV. But what we do, we subtract the CVs. So if I take this blue curve, subtract the red curve, I get this curve. This would be my unmethylated DNA. Really no signal. It's almost flat line. Whereas if I take this blue curve and subtract this red curve from it, I get this large blue curve. This is my methylated DNA. It's a positive signal. It's a large signal. And you can have lower bounds, upper bounds for these signals to program into your device to determine if it's above a certain threshold. It's a positive test for that event, for that hybridization event in this case. So this was the sequence we used for, for the pro-DNA and the respective sequences for the target non-methylated and target methylated. It's the exact same sequence except here you see the cytosines are all methylated. It's the hypermethylated sequence from the gene. Now this is our instrument. This is our potential stat. It's the black box. Everybody looks likes a black box. That's the potential stat right here. I have it highlighted because the table was black. You might not be able to see the box. But it's a small device. Okay. Not large at all. These other devices, this is just a power supply. It's a variable power supply. You can make it much smaller. You can make it the size of a cell phone power supply. But we're using this one so we can do other experiments later on with other devices. So this has many more uses. But as far as the instrument, the package itself, the potential stat, this is our 16 channel potential stat. This is where we're moving on now. So all the experiments conducted up to now was using a single, a one channel potential stat, right? All the CVs you saw were simply single CV conducted one at a time. Now we have our potential stat connected to a data acquisition board. This is the National Instruments Lab View. What this does, it controls and reads the data going to and from the potential stat, controls the potential. And we can control the potential from negative 5 to positive 5 volts. And also, we can read the current from 10 picoamps to 100 milliamps. 10 picoamps is 10 to the negative 12. Okay, 10 to the negative 12. The really small currents can be measured with this potential stuff. And I actually have, this is running the software. You can kind of make out the individual 16 channels. Each of those channels would be a CV in itself. I'll have a better view of that. Okay. So here's the software, just a, a screenshot of the software, 4 by 4 16 channels. You see, on the, this, this is a lab view program we created. Each of these channels can be turned on and off. So you have one channel you might not want to use. Okay. Or maybe you want to keep that off. You don't want to deposit any polymer. Maybe you only want to deposit the polymer in channel number 5 through 8. Okay. You would turn everything else off. I don't know if you can see, but in the corner here, these are the different programs you can run. You can run a pulse. You can run open cell potential, cyclical tomogram. All these different tests for the deposition or the cleaning okay, or just the CVs can be programmed using the software, using this LabVIEW software. We also did a test run, just a calibration chip, okay, turning some simple CVs off a calibration chip with resistors. And each of these channels were working fine. So the potential stat operates extremely nice 
and we can run all these channels simultaneously, basically 16 experiments at once. <coughs> so this is the data analysis software. Again, we're using LabVIEW to do the programming here. So it's very powerful. We, we can calculate the exact current under all these curves without having to import the data into Excel, and it does the calculation right then and there for us. So we don't necessarily have to go and do the subtractions. It's already performed using this program. Now, that was the potential stat. That's the instrument. To operate okay, or make use of that instrument, we need electrodes. What was being passed around was a single microelectrode, right? You, real thin. What we have here is 16 of those electrodes, disk electrodes, imprinted onto a chip. So this is what we're fabricating at Georgia Tech's uh, nanotechnology center. And that's the second part of the seminar. Dr. Paul Joseph will be speaking about the facilities over there. But what we're doing here, you can kind of make out these little circles. Those are platinum disc electrodes, 30 microns in diameter, 30 micrometers in diameter. And here's a micrograph, microscope picture. We have 16 of these here. These larger circles, those are also platinum. They can act as reference electrodes or counter electrodes. The bigger ones we would use as counter electrodes because of the large surface area, we can provide a good current. And these smaller ones, we can use as pseudo-reference electrodes. So each of these would be a microdisc electrode. And this isn't going to measure, it's not more than three centimeters by under one centimeter, 6.5 millimeters. So tiny little thing, but it contains 16 of those electrodes I was passing around. So how do we connect this to our potential stat? Well, I've already, we've already developed this PCB board, printed circuit board, and if you notice the pattern here, it's very similar to the pattern here, and what we have here are solder bumps. So tiny amounts of solder have already been applied here when we ordered them, and all we have to do is take the chip, so this is my chip, I take that chip, align it with these, that is pretty much self-aligning, put it on a hot plate, heat it to a certain temperature, the solder bumps, they melt, it attaches the chip to my printed circuit board. I need this printed circuit board so I can just connect it, it inserts into the chip connector on my potential stat. Real quick electrical okay, contact to the potential stat, I don't, I don't have to worry about wire bonding, I don't know if you've heard of wire bonding, but it's very tedious. You have to sit there uh, under a microscope and take micron okay, thickness gold, literally kind of like stitching. You attach it from one pad to another pad. You have to be very precise. If you miss one, you have to melt it off, do it again. Imagine doing that 16 times. It's a big headache. It takes at least, I used to wire bond, you know, chips. It would take a good maybe hour or so to do one chip. This it, it takes, you just align it, heat it up, it's done. It takes about maybe 10, 50 minutes, minimal work. Okay. You don't strain your eyes under a microscope. Okay. So in summary, <coughs> we illustrated how we can detect the GSTP1 sequence especially methylated DNA sequences with our electrochemical probe. And now that we have the 16 channel potential stat and we're fabricating the chips, actually chip fabrication, we were supposed to uh, be done with it this past week, yeah. so hopefully we'll get a good batch of maybe 50 working chips soon. We can test that with our potential stat. We can run these experiments, these 16 individual experiments simultaneously do all sorts of statistical analysis on that as well. So this would be an excellent tool to detect biomarkers for prostate cancer. Because it's already been shown, we've already shown we can detect the methylated sequence. All we have to do now is 
show we can replicate the results with the chips. So we're moving from the microelectrodes, the single microelectrode, to these chips. That's that's for a future talk. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to thank, thank Dr. Kualik. He helped with the synthesis of the TPT at Georgia Tech, Janusz Kualik, as well as NIH for funding the project under this grant number, under the Remy project. And if you guys, I'm, I'm done here, so that's it for me. More than happy to take questions before Dr. Paul Joseph. I have one or two questions, or uh, should I take the questions after?